This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Carla Bozulich on August 20th, 2017 in Los Angeles, California for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much. Very excited to finally meet you. You too. <clears throat> um, so this is what I mentioned when we were coming up, is that this is the, their personal and professional biographies. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up, um, your family of origin. I know a bit about your, you know, teen years and stuff, but I don't know much before that. Mm. I grew up in a town called San Pedro, which is really close. It's less than 30 miles, but it's real. It's very much, it's about as different as it could be. It's really, it really is its own town. And it's the port of Los Angeles. It's a place where I would, at least when I was growing up, it was primarily, um, mm, immigrants, it was a lot of Latinos, a lot of Yugoslavians for um, very specific reasons, which is like a, a great deal of my family. Um, it was a lot of longshoremen, a lot of blue collar. It's, it's hard to explain how beautiful and amazingly fantastic it was and this combination of also just super rough, like just people treating the concept of rough as if it was completely normal. Like the idea when I started to see that there were other sides to humans, I literally was surprised to, to see that like, you know, that's not how all dudes were. Um, you know, that there wasn't like this, like, you know, you didn't just like get in a fight because you disagreed with something just like pounding into people's faces in the supermarket. You know, like, this just was, wasn't going on everywhere. <laughs> you know, and um, that's Pedro. Like, I love Pedro to this day. There's parts of it that I literally dream about. If people come to LA, I tell them go to Point Furman Park, do not miss the cat lady. Look at the oldest wooden lighthouse in the United States. Try to go down to Second Park. You know, like um, just different things about Pedro that are just, you know, go to Sunken City. These things are like my soul. Like I was, I was raised in the water. There's no beach there. It's all rocks and cliffs. And that's my life. Like that's me. That's who I am in a way. I'm rocks and cliffs and water. And just like so many times almost dying in the ocean and just being like, okay. And then just like, it, it never seemed strange that I almost died because of just like not being able to find the sky so I could go up there and breathe. And that was life, you know, and, it, and in so many ways. I mean, you could, I guess, put it symbolically if you want and um at at home it was just almost too bizarre to talk about but there were i don't really want to get into the bad parts of that right now because it's so boring to me but um the things that were amazing was that i saw sun Ra when i was 10 years old i saw ornette coleman i saw um you know just like it just so many incredible Mose Allison. I just saw. I just saw like incredible musicians and performances. I went to the Lighthouse in Redondo regularly as a child. Um, you know, with my mom going, she's got to come in. She always comes in. You know, and like because um, my mom would always bring me to the jazz shows. Nobody else wanted to go, and my mom would always bring me to the art shows. So I was like, you know. You know, I just I just got to see like the German expressionists, you know, and I'm like 12 years old and, and you know, things like that. And, and Swan Lake all performed by, you know, like 18 year old gay boys wearing nothing but black feathers, you know, and, and, and this was like the kind of thing my mom wanted to check out and she wanted a buddy to go with her. So I got to just see so much culture and I honestly, and uh, like for for sure like i don't remember a life 
where Jimi Hendrix was not a dominant force in my life and just like making my life work, just making my life work, just putting that needle onto the record and just, yeah, just blissing out and understanding everything. And um, so in this way, I feel that I have a huge advantage over a lot of people because we're talking about, you know, books, like huge library, um, you know, my mom was an English teacher. She, you know, taught me a lot about writing. She taught me a lot about, um, you know, all that sort of thing. She took me to school with her, which was in Compton. She taught in Compton for 20 years. She taught me about civil rights. She marched. She taught me about, like, why do you march? She, you know, she, she was a, um, in the... Um, National Organization of Women. She, she was just like, you know, this is in the 70s, so I'm 51 right now, so it's like we're talking about in the 70s now. And um, I, I just consider myself, along with the fucking shit that happened to me as a child, which was bad, um, that this other stuff... I think in a way has been longer lasting and more precious to me than sitting there like griping about the um, heinous bullshit that went down. And um, so it's, it's what I prefer to talk about actually. And I, I could talk and talk about it. It's just like, you know, when I first started painting, because that was my first art, my mother was the one that gave me her paints from college. And I said, Mom, I'm interested in painting. And she said, really? I think I was about nine. And she was like, take this box. It was a, you know, just a wooden box with a handle. And I opened it up and it just, whoosh, the smell and the brushes and the paints and, and you know, and she was like, here's some, you know, heavy paper and a thing and paint on a plate. That's just good enough. That's what we did, you know, and, and um, use the paint on a, on a, mix the paint on the plate, you know, and so I immediately painted an, a background of, of pitch black that slowly faded into blood red and then just had tiny little tears that went into like giant tears <laughs> that was my statement <laughs> fucking god damn it that's what i wanted to say and i got it said <laughs> without words so it sounds like your mom really um I love that you're talking about this because everything that I read about you, it kind of talks about the stuff that you were saying you don't really feel like going into right now. And this is good to know. I didn't know, I didn't know any of this. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like whatever your relationship was with your mother, that she really helped to foster that like. Your yeah, and my, and my, that. both my fathers. <laughs> yeah. Same, both of them actually. And the ocean. Yeah. It's hard to explain how influential the ocean can be. Like at, just at this moment, I I feel the salt. I feel, I feel the the temperature, the bubbles, the feeling under my feet, the pebbles when they fall off. Like when you're walking along, do 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 do, and pff, nothing, you know. And it and it's just, it's me. It's who I am. I don't think people look at me and see that, but that's that's me. And I don't talk. Don't talk? Not then, not much. Oh, okay. Very little talking. Yeah. I did these other things. I wrote a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I wrote a lot of stories. I wrote um, imaginary scenarios, like hallucinatory scenarios having to do with all sorts of... I, I, I wrote like about the Hamburglar going into like, you know, 
the 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 center of the sun and stealing the the brightness so that the earth went black, you know, things like that. Like could just you know, and I and I drew pictures of the Hamburglar a lot. Really into the Hamburglar. What? Well, yeah. That guy was a mean motherfucker. Yeah, he was. Was that Burger King or McDonald's? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Some. That didn't really matter so yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, this is. I'm just curious. Were you? You were la kind of like laughing about going to school earlier, but were you also? A, were you a good student, or did you not? Care what you were. Mm, yeah. Really good until um, I was 11. When I was 11, I stopped all education pretty much. But up until that point, I had I had accelerated so much that um, and I had I I was a compulsive reader, so um, I you know I got pretty, um, pretty literate <laughs> before that point. But, but at that point, I just kind of, various things happened. And um, after that, there was like years of school missed and, and just bad grades and teacher, bad problems with teachers and, and just, you know, bad, bad kid stuff. And then like, I just quit. So, um, but I had already absorbed so much culture and so much just education in general because I was interested in the sciences. So, um, and I was interested in things that were not just artistic things and stuff and I would actually read about them, like, like just, you know, absorb this information that was, I guess now might, I might think was not number one on my list, but you know, things with astronomy and sci the sciences and just, um, I was never good at math, but you know, like I just kind of had enough of that to build off of in terms of when I did start really writing and, and also really articulating my, um, message that I'd like to, that I, that I want to put forward in any given moment artistically or the connection that I want to make with people. Um, a lot of the stuff that I read was really inappropriate for children. A lot of it was, you know, just amazing. Incred I met, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was, I don't even know how little I was. Like the book was right there. I read it. I read it like three times, you know, and I just still can't get over him just putting all that lie in his hair just to make it blonde. But um, that's not funny. That's not funny. Like that whole thing, you know, all of it. it that, was, that was really the biggest influence and maybe the most important influence of my childhood was the awareness and the refusal to go along with racism. And I think that I still feel that way, even with all of the gender issues and everything. And I don't mean to take sides. And I'm, I'm, I, I, well, I'm not going to apologize. I just think that racism is what's. It's. I can't even. Honestly, I can't. I can barely even speak about it. It's so. It's devastating, and I. I don't feel any guilt about it, but. I'm quite aware that I'm an, I'm an entitled person, you know, and, um, you know, it goes from there. The, the fact that, that it's so hard to connect even, like it just, just that, you know, we talk about connection between humans, but is that what we're talking about, you know, as artists, like really? <laughs> I don't think so. So, um, because it's so far, it's so much further. So for me, that's, that's kind of almost the number one thing, if I was able to be articulate about it and I really had studied it and, and understood things that 
people have, you know, put the whole history of everything together and are in the streets right now, like really understanding what's going on and what the relationship and the ratios of things are, I, I would be able to speak on it more articulately, but I am not able to, unfortunately. I would say that's my priority more than art yeah. or music. So, I mean, if that's something that you want to go into and talk about now, feel free. If you if you want to just um, kind of skip over that, that's fine, too. No, no, it, it's easy, though. But, I mean, it, music was, music is uh, sort of the way I describe the ocean. It's like, it's not possible to redact it from my nature. It's... It's a, um, it, it is just, was, it just was always there. I, I always was just in it. We were just in each other, like being in the bathtub, but it's, but it's almost like you're more, you're more inside of each other. It's like you're in blood and blood is in you and la la la. So, um, and I never thought about it very much except just how how great it was you know to listen to like k-day on my walking my mile home from school on my transistor like um ball and chain radio um you know and just everything like every minute had to do with music so the fact that it came around to me actually making sound with my voice was a big deal because i was very shy but um, but I've, I've had a lot of people along the way that have decided to push me and, um, and also just to influence me. And for me, it's been very specific people. And I wish that I could, I honestly wish I could, I could say it was more women, but in my case, it wasn't like when I when I heard for the first time when I heard Riot Girl for example I was like fuck yeah like it's girls doing this together you know fuck yeah you know but it, from in my case it wasn't the first time it was a guy who basically I had who I'm not going to tell you the whole thing but he, uh, but he was like yeah we're in the garage the mic set up you're going to sing. And he, he'd been telling me, he was like, you have a great voice, you have a weird voice, you have an interesting voice. And he's like, you need to sing it. And I'd be like, oh, right. And then one day he was like, yeah, the mic's set up. Um, Rich Polly Sorbate, 60, is sitting there on the drums. Dan's on the bass. I'm going to play the guitar. We're, gonna, we're, we're, we're in a band. We named it. It's the Neon Veins. And um, we played for about six months. And Rich is still around. You should check him out. He's, he's the, one of the most interesting people that I've ever known um, on television or anything. Um, so that happened. And then, then I got involved really, 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 really hard in, involved in drugs and I kind of just totally forgot about the idea of singing or being an artist or writer or anything like that. Excuse me. Oh. Excised. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, yeah and so what happened on that was at the age of 21, I got myself totally off of drugs and all this stuff and, and just started trying to 
get things together and and get my health together, which was in a very bad state. And and uh, a friend of mine, an old friend from the Neon da Veins days, um, John Napier, came and he said, Carla, don't you remember that you're a singer? You sang. Remember the Neon Veins? And I was like, Neon Veins, whatever. And he said, look, I brought a four track. I have some, some beats on there. Back then, I have to tell you, having beats was not, that's not what you would have. It was like grunge days. It was before electronics were an accepted form of music, especially live music. Um, I have some beats on here. I and some criticisms of people that you guys played like Lollapalooza with, which I didn't realize, like looking back now, that it was as big of a deal as it was. It wasn't something that people did play live with, like recorded. Well, excuse me. Um, it wasn't recorded, like all of it wasn't recorded. A lot of, it, it's kind of hard to explain. I mean, people are still, they're doing it now. Yeah. It's what people, certain people do. Tricky did it, uh, uh, whoever does it. I don't even know who does it. It's not my thing, you know. But um, it's not just um, recorded music. It's not like people have a CD player and they hit go. Like the, the music, we had a live drummer, he was sampling live, we were playing the keyboards, we were doing like all this stuff. There was a um, backing track, which is something that you need to do like really solid dance music. And that's what we were doing was this really solid, fucked up, dirty, ugly dance music that people could have a really good time to, or they could say, why aren't you playing guitar? And that was our thing. Like we, we didn't have guitars because we wanted the, to separate. We wanted that separation. We wanted to piss people off and have a good time and like separate it into like people that were just like really there to just have a great time, you know? And, and the other people to just sit in the corner with their arms folded, just being like mad and thinking of bad jokes. Um, so, but on the other hand, I know who you're talking about and I'm not going to say her name because I know her group that she was in at that time. They played right after us and the, the, what their thing was, like that was our thing. What their thing was, was to make fun of people. So they weren't actually making fun of us. They were just being the project that they are. That's their project. It's, I don't want to say their name because no, I don't, I, I don't want to yeah, keep no, the I thing know. going. It's just so stupid, the whole yeah. thing, but, but it's not, it, they didn't, I'm sure they couldn't have cared less. It was just fodder for their, you know, for their thing. I didn't even think about it like that. Yeah, it was just, that's, that's who, that's who that yeah. group is. Okay. So, um, you know, we gave them a gift. Um, and also I have to say that you should, that Ethel Meeple should never have ever performed in the daytime. It's not a daylight kind of thing. Like you just don't want to see that stuff in the day. Oh no. Um, anyway, he came and he said, I have a four, I have a four track here and, um, and I got some beats on it and I got some loops on it. I got a really hot track here, and I just, I'm, here's the mic, and here's the headphones. I just want you to put on the headphones, just listen for a second, and just start singing. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not a singer. He was like, Carly, you're a singer, and you have a really weird voice, and you need to sing. So he recorded me singing really simple, this song called Flower, super simple. And it came out kind of goth, and it was the first Ethel Meat Plow track. And I, I really like it. I, it's, it's still one of my favorites, honestly, and I'm barely, I'm not singing that much or anything, but the track's really slamming. It's like really good music. 
it's funny because if per somebody heard the music now, they wouldn't be like, oh, somebody pushed, pushed play on a, on a CD player, you know? It sound, it's a song, it's, it's what became acceptable to do. But John and Biff were way the fuck ahead of their time. You know, like they were just amazing programmers and they were using gear that now weighs like 50 times more than if you could just go buy it at, you know, at, at Garage Center and be like, here's, the, here's what you ordered, you know, and, and they were like rolling giant anvil cases out, you know, and to get the same stuff. So, I don't know, I, I still think of them as pioneers in a lot of ways. I mean, I, we toured with a lot of those bands and we watched them push the play on their CD players, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, it was good. And then um, after that, we kind of were winding down. We weren't getting along very well. We had played hundreds and hundreds of shows. We were on tour like nine months a year. We had great shows. The audiences were maniacal like just the audience we had a reputation for being crazy but it wasn't us it was the audiences they were maniacal they were crazy they'd jump on stage rip their clothes off dance like jump onto the drums knock the drums all over the place just like you know just bring stuff onto the stage start whipping it around um like just throw their at one time a guy i was in um I was in Detroit at the St. Andrews, and we were doing a big show there. It was totally packed. It's a big place. And this guy threw a T-shirt at me that was solidly sweat through with dancing sweat, because that's what people do when they at a normal Ethel Mee Plow show is dance and, like, turn into homosexuals. <laughs> um, and... He threw this shirt and it just slapped me in the face, almost like you would have had to like practice it 15 times to make it do that perfectly, but it did it perfectly. And I opened it up and it's a Dead Kennedy's Too Drunk to Fuck t-shirt. Like, I mean, I still wear it to this day. I was just like, I was just like, thank you, I love this, you know? Because of course I saw the Dead Kennedys when they were back in the day before that, like 10 years before. And, you know, and loved them, and I loved their political statement and, and just all that stuff. And so that band went, but it kind of got sort of it ran its course, you know. And also what happened, the other thing was that, interestingly, um, electronic music kind of caught up with Ethel Meatplow, and it wasn't that weird not to have a guitar anymore. I mean, at the time, we didn't have a guitar because we wanted to anger people like the band that I did not man mention their name that played after us at Lollapalooza. But um, by the time we quit, which was five years later, there were a lot of bands that didn't have guitars and that were using electronics and that had like that were making dance stuff and that you know grunge was over, you know, and 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 stuff like that. And so um, I was, because we were on tour all the time, I was already just kind of feeling this real roady, like road, road feeling. And I started writing songs about the road. And um, so it's kind of funny because in this band with no guitars, I was, I was thinking of these real simple sort of like guitar songs. And, um, I started playing them when I'd be off tour, and I, I wrote my first songs on guitar when I was like, I think I was about 24, or five, 24, five. And um, I had never written a song on guitar before, and um, they, they were, they're still like some of the songs that people request and like a lot, I don't really usually Play them, but even if they want them, but <laughs> but um, but they don't understand that the reason why I I could play them was because you don't move your fingers. Even if you move your fingers, you don't move the shape 
of your fingers. They just go like this the whole time, like this song Marmalade. It's in a shape, which is a G, but you never, you play it, it like six or seven places on the neck, but you never stop playing the G. So it's, it, that was how I started playing. And I just, I, I never, I was only used to touring. That's all I never ever knew how to do. So, I mean, I knew other stuff from before, but had no, no intention of going back to, you know, being like a dishwasher or whatever when I could tour. So I, um, or a maid. Um, so I um, just kept going, but I put a band together and I was, I was like, we've got to go on tour because that's all I know how to do. And I learned to play guitar on tour. So at first it was just like really bad sound. Like I wrote Lily Bell and I'm trying to write it, but I uh, play it, but it's just like, I'm messing up and messing up and messing up. And the band's just holding me together. It was a great band. Mm -hmm. The Geraldine Fibbers was a great fucking yeah. band. So, you know, they, they would just kind of hold me tight. Like they just secure me so that whatever I did, it still kind of worked, you know, and after a while I, I started to get it myself and and start to be able to write more sophisticated songs and things like that. Um, but I could totally trust my band to not just to be amazing players, but also to just sense me all the time because my time is very strange. Um, I don't know if that make. I'm not sure if you're a musician or not, but you are. So you you understand that time is like some uh, quite often, bump 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 bump. But my time sometimes skips a beat, mm -hmm. sometimes comes to the next beat like halfway too soon or whatever. And the band was always just right there. They just never missed it. They were just waiting for Carla time. They called it Carla funny? time. Yeah. <laughs> That's not something that you learned. That's just kind of how you play. Unfortunately, it's how I play. And actually, that's one of the reasons why I was hoping to have a drum conversation after the interview, because I'm having a really, really big problem with Carla time. Yeah. And I have to solve this problem. It's, you know, like the stuff that I do now, I generally um, make make my living off of. I do not make a quote unquote comfortable living. I, I make a, an artist's living, you know, and um, which means that when a bill comes, you know, I have to sweat it a little bit and figure out how that bill's going to get paid. And if I'm going to pay a portion of the bill or like the whole bill or, you know, that kind of thing, just like people and, and how it is these days. It's like that, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, but the band was like, we, we just kind of, what happened weirdly was that Ethel Meatplow was getting a lot of attention. Nirvana had blown up on a, on a indie label and, and Jane's Addiction had blown up on an, on an indie label, and, and, and Mud Honey had blown up on an indie label, and people were just like, this is not gonna happen. The, the major labels were like, this is not gonna happen again. We're just gonna sign every band that anybody says is the best band in their city. So the Geraldine Fibbers, Ethel Meatplow was kinda like, mm, breaking up and the Geraldine Fibbers were getting a reputation as the best band in LA, and we got signed to a huge, huge deal. And we went five years together doing our wildest dreams, you know, and helping people and, and helping ourselves and having health insurance and a brand new van and, and touring and touring and touring and touring and recording and recording you know, good, really good studios and really good gear and um, just taking care of each other like a family. And, and we, I mean, Ethel Meeplow was like that too. Everybody's like that, Jesus. 
I mean, at some point, you just kind of wish it wasn't like a family. <laughs> just like get a break from some of that reality. Um, but uh, but the Geraldine Fibers were very much like that. And, and But we really did take care of each other. And um, we, we never, I mean, I guess I can kind of say this as a point of pride, but them included, I don't think I ever played a show where I was like okay I better just do this show I'm just gonna like pretend that I'm into it or whatever I I don't think I ever did a concert where I wasn't 100% devoted to the audience even if there was three people in the audience which yes a lot of times there were in my life and um, I'm proud of it you know in a way And, and the other thing is that I don't remember 99% of those concerts, which I also know means that I really, really was there because I don't remember a damn thing about it. (laughs) So it's like a weird drug. It just takes you out for me. And for me, it's nice to have a relief from my own thinking, you know? I've heard uh, Christian Hirsch saying she's super glad that she has found a way to start remembering her concerts again. And she and I, from what I've read, have some similar conditions, let's say, um, in our um, neurology. And for me, it's, it's for me, it's like an it's an hour and 15 minutes where I just don't have to remember. I just don't have to. And I just treasure that. And for her, she's super psyched that she can now remember her shows. Yeah. And for me, if God, if I had to start remembering my shows, I would be, I'd be in torture. I, I, I love that I can't remember them. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, when you were talking, it reminded me reminded me a lot of when I interviewed Kristen and she's really oh she's like really open about all of this too you know but she had just done that kind of therapy so she was able to like remember shows and stuff and she was talking about how much better it is but the way that you both talk about and, and like describe your experiences with music sound really similar um, it's 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 a strange thing because it's so, it's such a great illustration of the way that art is completely, there's, there's nobody the same. Mm-hmm. We're all different. Yeah. And, it, and it, really, it really is true that like one, what works for one person is, is completely the opposite of what's working for the other person and it and it makes this like beautiful balance in a way and I love that I just I do I mean I I have a lot of things where I'm sort of like trying to take care of business with various treatments and such (laughs) and I have been for many many years and I and I do hold it together you know sometimes but barely um, I think she has a much bigger challenge than me, obviously. I mean, there's no question about it. She has to hold a family together. And that's, it, it honestly, remember a show or not, she's just got a much bigger challenge and it would take whatever it would take to do that, no matter what it was. And I'm so glad for her that what is working for her on both fronts is something that's pleasing her. I'm really so, so happy for her for that, you know? It's like, for me, I hope it's the same, you know? I feel like I'm still transitioning, even after all these years. I feel like, I hope that I sit down with you maybe another time and say, you know, this is, I, I'm, I'm really good with what I've ended up with as uh, the, the thing what I'm trying to say is that they just don't know how to treat neurologic problems mm-hmm. yet. It, I mean, they're just guessing. It's like they're throwing darts randomly at a dart board and they're, they're at a dart board and they're like blindfolded or something. They experiment on you. 
I mean, I, I don't mean this in a paranoid way or like in a horror movie way, but, um, <laughs> but they, uh, they really do. They try every drug. They're just like, how's this drug working? Oh my God, you had a seizure. Okay, well, let's take you off that. Um, you know, and then they're like, oh, you haven't slept for 14 days. I think this is probably wrong. All right, let's try, you know. I mean, and they literally will do that. Like, they'll just run through the gamut. They don't know. Yeah. And um, right now, it's something that um, It's something that you can never really, just as I'm positive that actually many more people uh, experience this same problem than maybe even talk about it, um, there's really no way to, to know that you're solving the problem and that what parts of it you should solve like what parts you need to hang on to because that's you. Like that is you. Do you want to give up you? The thing, you know, the last thing they said to me the last time I went to the doctor, they were like, look, this is my doctor of a long time. He's a cool guy. He's been trying for, with me for a long time. A lot of medications, different things, you know, try meditation, all this stuff. He said, look, Carla, the last thing we have for you are antipsychotics. And I said, and he goes, you're not psychotic. That's not your problem. And I said, well, what's it going to do for me? And he said, it's going to stop your feelings. It's just, it's going to do that for you. You won't feel these feelings. And obviously my feelings were severe at the time. Otherwise we wouldn't have been having that conversation. But he, he said, we can do that. And he said, I have to tell you, I hope you don't choose to do that because I think you're a really interesting person and you will be gone. He said, but you have to make your choice. It is here and you, you will be, you'll be alive. And he said, you know, I don't know if I'm even supposed to be saying this, but I kind of hope you don't do it. So it's a weird situation. And I know that tons of people go through this. It's, it's a private thing. It makes you want to be private. Sometimes you're just sitting by yourself. You don't want to talk to anyone. That's a big part of it, of course. Uh, and I, I feel for people because we need to be who we are. We have to keep our personalities. We have to keep our creativity. We have to keep the things we're interested in. We have to keep the love we have for other people. We have to keep the hate. We have to keep the rage. We have to, we have to fight. We have to fight the battles. Who's going to fight if it isn't us? You know, and, and so the, the thing is that uh, I do hope that they, they work on it. I do. And I want to keep doing my art. And my art has grown and blown up. I mean, like the stuff we're talking about to me is like ancient history. I'm 51 years old. It's like, uh, I know that it seems totally um, vital, especially because we finally reissued um, Lost Somewhere Between the Earth and My Home and, um, and the, the album with Willie Nelson, which is Redheaded Stranger. And they both just got reissued and it's totally great. But uh, what I have done since, I mean, literally in the United States, I do this in, I work in Europe now because when I'm in the United States, I'll say like, Hey, what's up? And they'll be like, Oh my God, won't you play again? God, it's, has it really been 20 years since you've played? And I'll be like, no, it hasn't been 20 years. It's been 2000 concerts, 2000, you know, it's like, very hard here. There's no money here. If I went to play at the Echo, they, they would pay, pay me like $100 oh, really? to play there. I mean, if I go to Europe or to Italy, they'll, play, they'll pay me something, I don't know, an average of 2,000 euro a show. I play 45 shows. I save my money. I come back. I put it in the shoebox. Ooh, I shouldn't even be saying this. 
Just don't IR tell us where the shoebox is. No, it's the IRS. I'm like, oh my yeah. god. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, but um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's like it, it's it's very it's hard because I grow the way we do when we haven't annihilated our personality. When we have these sort of neurologic problems, we haven't. We've decided not to annihilate our personality. We're going forward. We're going to keep doing our creative work that we started. I'm saying we now, and it's like it's like me, obviously, when I started painting that little painting with the black, with the tears and all that, you know, and and everything. And it's and it's like um, it's a it's a process that if you let it keep going, it's just going to grow and grow and grow just like you do. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing and it hurts and it, and then it's okay. And then there's like this and people die and it's horrible. And AIDS was a huge part of this whole thing. Huge, especially with, uh, Ethel Meeplow. It was a big, big influence on it. A lot of it was like, fuck you, you know, like, Fuck you if you don't like guitars. Fuck you if you have long hair and you're into grunge and you can't deal with the fact that all these people are fags and they're all kissing and they all love each other and half of them are gonna be dead in six months. Like, that was a lot of us. We were really into Queer Nation. We were all this stuff. But the thing is, you grow, you grow. Thank fucking God they found a drug that helps you get through HIV. It's like, you know, we grow, we grow, we grow. So it's like now... I'm, I'm working in Europe where they pay me some money and I'm teaching a lot. I'm teaching a lot of workshops on intuitive thinking, intuitive music, um, improvisation, um, listening to people rather than just being like, playing, I'm playing, you know, like, excuse me, uh, listen, listening to, to people and thinking, thinking of that as a form of playing. Like thinking of your personal silence as a form of playing your instrument, you know, and, and different things like that. I'm teaching that stuff. I'm also doing large scale multimedia performances. They take like three months to make. I, they give me crews. They, they give me these beautiful places to do them. It's, it's quite nice for me in Europe. Um, but for some reason, I just keep coming back to the United States. I just am really, I don't know. It's, it's almost like Pedro, like I was born in New York, but Pedro is like my home, you know? And um, so, I don't know. I talk fast, I know. Oh no, it's okay, I've been, um, you've answered like all of the questions that I have, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's really great because I haven't had to like interject or anything. Um, and it's really interesting. You just mentioned so many things that I had never heard before and probably wouldn't have asked you. So, um, uh, I did want to know one, boy, this might be really boring for you to talk about, so if it's too boring, it doesn't... I'll make it exciting. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just kind of... I'm curious about your... Because you were on a major label for five years, and uh, it doesn't sound like you had a very miserable experience. Like, I hear a lot of horror stories from people, especially in the 90s, um, where, you know, they their album didn't sell enough and so they were dropped and then they were like destitute but it sounds like you had a pretty good experience and just um i guess what your experience was on a major label versus being on smaller independent labels and well i guess we'll just start there because now it's like is there even a music industry anymore or not not really well that's not really part of it for me like the answer um in a way is to do with a certain like sort of posi like 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 place we choose for our ego like where are we going to choose we're independent artists we don't have to answer to the man 
you know? We fought our whole lives to be, to, to not have to alter our work or, or, or do something that somebody says we have to do so that we can make money. We've, we've, we've been, uh, we've, we've been willing to, to live with a lot less money than other people. We've, we've worked hard to be genuine artists and, and genuine to our own heart, whether other people like it or not, fuck them. Just fuck them. And the thing about it is that I think for a lot of people, major labels represent money, a lot of money, and they're, they were made, <clears throat> let's say were, let's just say were, I don't know where they are either, yeah. I have no idea, <laughs> but um, uh, were like major corporations, huge, having nothing, to, really, let's get down to it, nothing to do with art, really, let's just nothing, except that, that there was a product. Let's, let's say that, that, our, that music just suddenly turned into like Cheetos or something, you know, and, and um, so the thing about it is that nobody, none of us wanted to be associated, to have our art, our, our like real thing we fucking fought for for our whole stupid fucking life to do this thing, like no matter what, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, this is what I'm doing, I don't care if you like it. So the thing is that, that here we are and now we're faced with like, do we choose the indie label? Do we choose the major label? The major label has money, the indie label doesn't. But, but they are there for music. That's the reason they're there. That's the only reason they exist. I'm saying this theoretically, by the way, theoretically, totally, the whole thing. So you got the major label. And the thing is that it's been said that major labels will screw you. They will simply screw you. If you get with a major label, they'll tell you one thing and then they'll do another and then they'll end up owning all your publishing and you will end up actually owing them money. Like you'll owe them money. You'll owe them money and they'll own your publishing so you'll never make a penny from your work and they'll, they'll own the, um, the rights to your music as well. So basically what you have is a record that they don't even need to put out either. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what major labels have that, that indie labels don't usually have is contracts. They have contracts that are written by lawyers that are very, very sneaky, snide motherfuckers. There's no doubt for that. But the first thing that you do if a major label hands you a contract and you know that, that their lawyers are sneaky, snide motherfuckers is read it. Read the thing. If it says they're going to keep your royalties, if it says you could owe money at the end, if it says that you can't have the masters to your record, if it says they can control the music, if it says they can control the artwork, if, the, if it says that they can tell you where to record, if it says that anything like that, you have to decide, you have to step aside with yourself and decide personally, is that all right? And if that's not all right, then get in there, tell them which ones are not all right, or just tell them fuck the fuck off, you stupid fuck, and go over to the indie label who has no promise to you whatsoever what they do. They can do anything. They can do anything they want, unless you have a label that is made up uh, that they are so, the integrity is so powerful that they have like Cranky or Constellation or whatever, that if they screwed you over in those ways, you know, Thrill Jockey, whatever, they, they, their whole life and reputation would be ruined. And also they just wouldn't do it. They love music. 
They love music. They're there for music. The other thing that's different than, than the way people paint the whole, like, so, so you have a handshake deal with an indie label, by the way, usually, let's say. There's some middle ground somewhere, I'm sure. But anyway, regular thing with a righteous indie label, one that you really trust, is that you have a, um, an agreement with them where you agree on the things that you want. You tell them, I want to keep my publishing. Is that cool? I want to keep my masters. Is that cool? I don't want you to be able to tell me what my artwork is. Is that cool? I don't want you to be able to tell me how to change my music. Is that all right? If they say yes to all of that or whatever amount you want, you shake hands. They make enough money that it tips to the point where they have made all the money they spent to make your record. So let's say distributing, uh, pressing, everything, album cover, all this shit, it might cost 15,000, it, it, okay? Then when they hit that point, they start paying you 50 cents on every dollar. You 50 cents, they 50 cents, you 50 cents. That's straight up shake hand de dealing with an indie label. That's, that's like purely perfect. Um, if, there's, if there's conversation to be had, like, yes, we'd like to be able to have some influence over your, your record cover, okay, discuss it, whatever. The, the other side of it with major labels is that if you read your contract and you don't understand some of it, like there's a term called in good faith, doesn't that sound pretty? I like that, that term. Nice. Very nice. Well, it's not. It's not nice. And you need, you need a lawyer to tell you that in good faith, in this sentence, is bad for you. So in a way, if you're doing something that's worth that much money, where you're risking, like where you have to pay to have your record on the thing and you'll never have royalties or anything, it might be worth having a lawyer look at it, you know? And, and the other thing is, once you're in there, the label is full of people that love music. Full. They're just waiting for a good band. They just want to help you make it, you know? So it's not like there's nobody there that gives a shit. What it is is that the corporation itself does not give a shit. They really don't. So the thing is, like, if, if you are cool with that, then actually there's human beings in there. There's like people handling the press, people handling the artwork, people handling this and that, the videos, stuff like that, F videos and things like that, by the way, that you'll never get on your, on your um, indie label. A lot of the stuff, obviously, you'll never get. Um, and then, you know, so it's, it's a little more complicated than just, saying major labels against indie labels. It's really something you have to sit with your band and, you know, contemplate the fact that some of it is written and some of it is handshake. And if you want it to be written over on this handshake side, you're risking the whole deal because it's not the way it's done. Like I have, I have done, I don't know, six records with Constellation we, handshake, we have had a handshake on every record, and it's always been straight up. They've paid me my royalties straight up, and um, everything we've agreed to, which, for example, on my artwork, I've always had my artwork, but I've always loved it when Ian, one of the owners, would go in and just tweak it a little bit and put, like, a better font, you know, and things like that. But, but that's not what it was on my major label, label thing. They could have never done that. They could have never touched it because that was what my contract said. It said, you will never touch one pixel on my artwork. And they signed it. So that's that. Mm -hmm. But Ian has, has a different way, you know. So that's, that was what it was to work with Constellation was things like that. They're better at also like um, song listing, song orders. So that, I'm psyched about it because I think they're artists. Whereas like you turn to Virgin and you can't really be sure they're artists. <laughs> so 
So I love that, you know, Constellation, they're artists, you know, let, let them have a say, you know, let them be like, why is the tuba just like jumping way out over the voice on this one, you know, things like that. So I don't know. It's, it's a very personal thing. And I think it's, it's actually, it, even though it seems like something where you could come down on one side or the other, it, it, I think it actually is something that you and your band sit down and discuss the differences. Because they're actu- I have another label that has written to me and said, stop writing to me. You will never receive a penny of anything that you, and this is a big record that I have. It's one of my bigger records, indie, quote unquote, records. He sent me two bad invoices in like four years. They're supposed to send them every quarter. And I I wrote and I was like, what is going on? You're charging me for 200 vetiver CDs on my last thing, which is a lot of money, by the way. And, um, He wrote back and said, we will never pay you a dime, so you may as well never write to me again. And that was a handshake deal, the same kind as with Constellation, exactly the same. I hope I don't seem too weird and tweaky right now. It's just that it's like so, it's a very intense, it's a very intense um, subject because we play for our heart and we play because we have to. That's why it's weird. It is a weird thing to think, well, should I go with over this guy? (laughs) So it is intense, it is. You've described a lot of your, I mean, you've collaborated with a lot of people and done a lot. You're always doing something, it seems like, or working on a project. Um, so I'm going to leave it up to you to talk about, because you've done so much, don't want to, like, you know, make it like a Wikipedia page or something and go through each one. Mm-hmm. So whatever you want to talk about or you think is most pertinent. But you've described um, many of your projects and collaborations as happy accidents. They seem Mm. to happen like kind of organically rather than, um, I'm just sort of wondering how you work or how you come up with, with ideas. Do you ever plan things out in advance or do you kind of just like start and then find the people to work on that particular idea? Mm. It really depends on the tour. I would say that, um, first of all, there's certain people that I don't, I have no idea who I would be if it wasn't for them. Nels Klein is certainly I, the, the first person that comes to mind, but it's not, it's really not. What Nels did for me the most, besides, I mean, he just continues to, to contribute to my work. I mean, he just recently did. Uh, but... Um, The biggest thing Nels did, when we were in the Geraldine Fibbers, we were basically best friends already. Like, we were just inseparable best friends. We talked all the time in the van. Like, it was just, it was kind of just dear, you know. But he said, Carla, you are a born improviser. You need to be nurturing that side of yourself more. I want to play with you more on that level. And I just, I would... I, I'm just telling you, you should start to see, think of yourself more that way and not just a person that plays songs that are written and the parts are exactly the way they were. And that was, a, that was actually a, a nice turning point for me um, because I respect him so much, especially as an improviser. So it was, uh, and not just an improviser, a person who, do you know people who sense other people in a way where they are like it's almost like they they see the 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 potential in a person and it could be totally different things any anything like it just I don't I don't know like maybe they should they would be like god you'd be great working with kids you know what I mean like something like that 
But he is really good at that, and he's really good at that with music. So, like, if he was working with Yoko Ono, for example, which I'm hoping he will be soon, um, he would see what she wants to say. And he would also probably see how to say it in a way that would reach more people. And so he's, he's just a, a very skillful person in that way. And so when he, I mean, knowing that, when he said it to me, I, I was like, I'm going. I'm going, I'm going with this. And I really did. And, and actually, it took me a while, like a couple of years, of just trying to open and like sort of rip this part of myself open. And now I'm just a person that I don't really have any other way of playing. There isn't really another, that's, it's, I've, I've actually sort of found the normal part of myself is just to um, listen to what's going on around me and respond to it and respond to it with things that were not an idea that I had before I heard what is going on around me. And, and I, I love to play with people like that. And I also love to play with people that are, um, you know, doing the same with me and, or that have a great idea that I can sort of like enhance or just make stronger or, you know, just vice versa. And, and I think that in a way, when people, I guess in the scene, people start to sort of gravitate towards each other that are, you know, interested in that kind of thing because it's actually sort of not the, I would say it's kind of the underdog of the, of the rock scene, if you want to even put it in the rock scene. So it's, it's, you know, it's not, there's not that many people that are like, ah, I'm going to go hear an improvised music show tonight, really excited, you know. Um, my thing is hard, like I'm into hard music. Um, uh, f let it be sort of like um, harsh or the subject matter is really brutal or um, painful or things like that. Actually, most other music is pretty boring to me and I'm not super into rock and roll anymore. It's kind of just like I love noisy shit that's really imaginative and that challenges people, maybe frightens people, um, makes people feel like strong, like something shooting through them, make, you know, just th things like that. And, and so I, I feel that, you know, that's the phase I'm in now. And, and I'm into teaching, really into teaching this thing of almost like clearing your brain. It's kind of, we, pe we play, yeah. we play a lot. Like there's a lot of playing and a lot of like sort of featuring people in the workshops, but a lot of it is clearing your brain so that you can see what happens, you know? And um, I just, uh, yeah, it, I think it, I found a, a lot of um, my future in, in that kind of a thing. I mean, but there's like stuff, um, have you ever heard Annette Peacock's been on the streets too long? It's a, it's a song, you know, it's yeah. a, it's a song. And um, with, with an, an, on an album with one of the hottest album covers ever. Uh, and um, when I listen to something like that, I think I wish I had that. I wish I had that power to hit a chord in people that is um, like uh, what's the word that 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 does make them feel like you know they're being moved, they're being dragged, they're being they're being like you know m molded into a different person or responding to something that they would have walked past because I've been in the streets too long, right? Like who gives a shit? if you've been in the streets too long, after a while in a city. You know what I mean? Like, really, how long you been in the streets? Who cares? Gone. Bye. <laughs> and um, 
And so she sings it in this way and she plays the piano in this way and, and this thing where you realize that, uh, that all around you, all these people and women and, and, and their children, who are their children? She sings about a child. Who, who's the child? Where is the child, you know? And, and uh, I do wish in a way that I had the ability to make a song, like really, it's in a song structure, mm -hmm. you know? So I think in a way, like I might turn all, uh, like all the way around and start to shoot for that kind of um, ability because I'm not really a master of an instrument. I play guitar and I love it and I, I love it. And I play bass, yep. I'm super into bass right now. I mean, my instrument is my voice, but it's, it's a, I'd, I'd love to be able to play a piano or something like that and just really say something the way she does. You could play piano. She's a hero. Yeah. Um, I hope this isn't also a boring question, but um, I noticed when, when I was reading about you, and uh, you know, just like reviews of various albums, um, you come across as, as someone who easily kind of crosses genres or def or like defies genres. Um, but I'm wondering how you how you feel about people categorizing your music. There seems to be this kind of like obsession. With, you know, like I was reading about Boy, which I just love, I love. Um, but try to, cat cat go ahead and cat let, let me hear you I mean, categorize I it. I have no idea what I would <laughs> categorize. Right, I mean, the um, this, this thing about it, pop album. I gotcha. The yeah. thing, the thing, the reason I call it the pop album is because, very simply, it has drums, <laughs> guitar, voice, uh, bass, and the other guy. <laughs> and that's, for, for me, like, that's as far on a, as for a pop album as I've gotten since the Geraldine Fibbers. Mm -hmm. So um, that's A. And B, they, the, except for the last piece, they're songs. I mean, they repeat, they have choruses, they have verses, they have bridges, they have instrumental sections. I mean, people might not think of maybe the way they're hearing it or um, the fact that the songs don't all sound the same. That would really help. I think that if the songs all sounded the same, excuse me, that um, maybe then people would think of it. But I, I don't really care. I, I, I said it was a pop album to people because I wanted people to think what is pop? That's all. I don't give a shit what people think my albums are, but the and I know that they aren't. They aren't. I, my next album with um, I have an album called Quieter. Mm -hmm. That's gonna have I've have determined the style it is. I think when you hear it, you maybe you'll agree, maybe not. Then I already know what my next album is. It's called Echo Fucking Park. And that album is a rock album. It's my rock album, okay? So right now we have the pop album, the quieter album, <laughs> and the rock album. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, I'm calling it the rock album because it fucking rocks, but the thing about, and I love to rock, but, but it's, um, the thing about it that's so funny is when you're in Europe and you see any gig, it doesn't matter what the gig is, they have to categorize what the band is. They have to. So they'll be like, folk noise rock, or it'll be like, it'll be like, sex disco dance, or it'll be like, whatever. It doesn't matter what the, who the band is. And with me, it'll be like, folk rock art. I was going to ask what you were. In your but it never, it was all, always different. Yeah. And it depends who read the what. They'll be like, 
country rock <laughs> sex dance, you know, and it's like it has nothing to do with what the show's going to be at all, nothing. Yeah. But they have to do it. And to me, I think after seeing that for so long, that a lot of it was what made me write that it was the pop album because right. it was just it's just so funny the way they do that. And I guess people have to see something before they will go to the show. Like they have to see some description in Europe why they, they have to do it. Like, I don't know. It's very, you know, it's always the same things, folk, rock, pop, dance, sometimes sex, disco, electronic. Mm -hmm. And now we have noise. So, uh, but my, I, I don't care at all. I mean, I, I know for a fact that what my music is, is that by the time I get from one song to the next, I've already completely changed what I'm doing. So it's like, there's no way to put a genre to it. It's, I, I've changed everything. The, probably the musicians, the instruments, the maybe the recording thing, where I am, what country I'm in, every, everything is different. It's not, they, you cannot categorize it. So it's kind of just funny when people do it. I just, I find it to be, I mean, we always, every time there's an article or an or a interview or preview, we always wait to see the category yeah. that we're in, you know. I guess art rock. Can we go with art rock? What do you think? Yeah, I feel, I feel so broad, <laughs> but yeah, I mean art rock. Yeah. And then art rock would, you know, then there's all the subcategories. And then like rock, rock, there's a problem with the rock thing because sometimes yeah. it, it just loses the beat completely. Yeah. You kind of need a beat for rock, right? Like, yeah, what you're saying, like one, two, three, four, like that's rock, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what I would call you. I was just wondering what you thought of it. Um, Spaz junk? <laughs> See, that's... <laughs> um, okay, I wanted to ask you this just because I'm curious and I, I was surprised when I read um, the quote. Um, it was from an interview in 2014 you said that you were worried that younger people who were your audience would be put off by a person your age singing about Fucking. sexuality and <laughs> um, and then the, the person who wrote the article said it's hard to imagine Nick Cave, the singer to whom she's most often and favorably compared entertaining such anxieties um, and that you're like thinking that was a mark of the sexism that's still prevalent in um, you know, you know, pop culture and rock criticism and things. I'm just wondering, because that was from 2014, I'm wondering if like your thoughts on that have, cha have changed, if you are, if you're still, because I think of you more as someone who like, de kind of, like defies genre and defies age, I, I guess, like you've been doing, re oh, sorry, did, oh wait, did, it fell off. Is it okay? Yeah, it's still hanging. Yeah. It's just hanging. Do you want it to go back where it was? Yeah, it's on the chair. I don't see the chair at all, so just put it on the chair. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you still feel that way about playing live and the content of your songs and your audience? Well, the thing is that right now I have plans for, um, I mean, I'll do a tour in the spring because I'm broke and I'll probably do a tour, another one next year, but those are not what I'm working on. So, um, so it's 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 not as much of I don't really think about anything like that, but um, because I think the audience is going to be whoever they are, and then 
or then I'm not doing that anymore. But um, I think if I was a 25 year old boy and I was just like kind of like an indie rocker guy who was into like pavement reissues or whatever, <laughs> um, that if I saw a woman on stage who was as older, older, probably older than their mom, um, and that the way that I sing about sex is absolutely um, unedited. So if I want to sing about sucking a cock, I just sing about sucking a cock. I don't sit there and go like, oh, my tongue on her pussy is not going to fly. So I haven't really done the tongue on the pussy thing, though. Hmm. <laughs> that might be... The <laughs> but anyway, um, I remember when I was in Ethel Meeplow, I was quite young. I was like 20, maybe 22 at the time. And we were playing a, a, a concert at a, at a metal place. And we had this dancer. We had this fabulous dancer, Jim Riva, who died of AIDS. And he would always dress up. And he was kind of like chubby and hairy. And just was kind of like, just already, no matter what he already did. And, and he, would, he, would, he wore like a long, curly, like long metal hair thing and then like a tiger, like tiny tiger, like, uh, like, what do you call those? Like a or yeah. yeah, like, but, but metal, it yeah. looked, it looked really metal and, and he, he danced and, and I was wearing, um, a, uh, like a, I don't want to use the term wife beater. So I'm going to say <laughs> white tank top um, and suspenders in these giant, like, men's pants with the rip in the crotch, which is totally inadvertent. Like, the rip, seriously. And it said on my arm um, in giant red letters, cock sucker. And, um, and, 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 we, and I had, like, just, like, my hair was pretty much shaved. And um, we just, like, did our thing. And these, these women came and they were just so excited. Like they were just so fucking excited and they just like ripped my clothes off of me. They were just so excited, you know, and like, and, and, um, and then, um, the thing is that that's, you know, and there was all these boys, all straight boys, gay boys, everybody like dancing, da, 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 da. This is like the greatest thing ever. And then like to have that now, not that I would rip my clothes off now. I, I mean, I look good. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying it's, it's not really, you know, where I'm at. Um, so, but I kind of feel like for a boy, he's 25, he's looking at a woman I'm okay, maybe I kept myself together a little better than his mom did. But, you know, and I'm obviously like cuckoo, which he thinks maybe that's, that might be pretty cool <laughs> or not. And, um, you know, I do. Honestly, I'm not saying it against him. I just think that it might be hard for that kid to be like, yeah, this is my shit. I'm totally into this woman who's older than my mom like, I mean, she, I'm not Annette Peacock. You should hear what Annette Peacock yeah. sounds like now. It's Never. not that. She's not writing cocksucker on her arms. Yeah. You know, it's, she's, she's a grown-up woman. She's, she's aged with grace. She's absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. She's a lot older than me. Um, she's a phenomenon. But 
I didn't make that transition. Like, I still feel just as free to say absolutely anything I want. I don't care. There's a lot of naked pictures of me from the last two or three years. I, there's like, it's all fine for me. But I do feel that for some younger people, uh, and it's a shame because in a way, those are the people I'm, not, I'm making a generalization and that's not right. I have a lot of older fans, obviously, because they've been staying with me for a long time or they find out about me or, you know. And I think it's nice for somebody to find out there's somebody that's their age that's still, um, you know, that's still ripping it up. I think that's really nice, you know. But the messages I'm trying to say are, some of them are actually like, I'm actually trying to make messages for people to help them on their way. You know what I mean? And so I do, I would really like it if the 25 year old people uh, would understand that like I am fucking with them and they are, I have my fucking, their head in my elbow and we are walking hand in hand and that is really what's going on like we're doing this together and we're going to do this you know and you are not going to be a person that is in 30 years looks back on your life and goes what the fuck happened off of that, I also read another quote that I just, I want to know what you have to say about it. He said, I can talk about feminism and how music relates to that, and I turned into a slobbering madman. Can you expand on that? Because there was nothing else, it was just that quote, and then like the article ended, and there was no real context, and I didn't know... The, the, I mean, my, the answer's pretty short, too. It's just okay. that I don't feel um, equipped to talk about that. I, I don't even know for sure if I'm a woman. I don't know how to talk about feminism as it relates to me. Like, I have not been discriminated against. That's all I can say is it's never happened. I mean, obviously, I've been discriminated against as a gender. Yeah. You know, if, if you want to put me into that category, I've been horribly discriminated against, and it's a, it's a tragedy. But as a musician, I have never been discriminated against. Um, and I have just one really general question that I ask everyone, um, and everyone's answers are always different, it's really interesting. Um, what are your thoughts on the visibility of women in like rock history, I guess, as a whole? Is there a gender discrepancy? Um, is gender not really an issue anymore? Has it changed? Is it better now or is it worse now? And I know it's kind of a weird question because it's like what, I guess, you know, what is rock history, I guess, or how do you measure that? But I'm, I'm just thinking of how, how people are remembered and who is remembered and why they are remembered. And it seems like, it seems to me that there is a discrepancy, which is why I'm doing this. Hmm. And that's why you're doing this. To fill out the narrative. And I know that there are so many 
Yeah, well, it's not my interest. I could go off. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I'm asking you that because yeah. I am interested in the fact that you have such a concise reason why you're doing this. Yeah, I mean, and we can excise all of my talking out of this <laughs> afterwards because, again, like, it's not my interest. But, no, no, um, I, me, I'm really the, interested. Okay, because for me, it's very personal and... Um, I'm really passionate about it and I feel like some people think I'm crazy because they I can see what this is gonna look like like 50 years from now and how I, can you see because I can see it's gonna be bigger I hope I mean number oh because there's more, more it, it gets more to be more women. it's not gonna be just like um, the people that I'm choosing I'd like to have more people involved on both ends you know it's not gonna be just me like interviewing people forever um but I think like Lydia once she introduced me to you she's the first person that I interviewed and so I told her how I discovered her which was you know this is pre-internet and it's kind of like in the I guess in the suburbs at the time but I couldn't find any information about her. I had heard her on the Sonic Youth Death Valley 69 song, which she was one. like, I fucking hate that song. That's my favorite <laughs> Sonic I, Youth song. It's mine too. And I was like, who, that's not Kim Warden. Who is this woman? And it was so hard to find any information that, you know, it was like 96 or 97 or something. And um, I didn't live in the city. I didn't have access to a lot of stuff. It was pre-internet. And I just don't, I, once I found out who she was and all of the things that she'd done, like she is so hugely important. Um, and I just don't feel like she's been adequately rep, which I also get it because she operates on like this kind of underground level. So it's like, don't expect, you know, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or whatever to ever acknowledge Lydia Lunch, but I don't feel like she's even respected on like an, an indie level, really. And just the... Do you the think it's part of her age? That's kind of like where I'm, you know, like, is it? Is it part I of that? Like for, I mean, I don't... Like, if she was 20, if she was 25 and she was singing the stuff she's singing, is that cool? Because I think yeah, people I think expect so. me to like get up on a bar stool and start singing like James Taylor songs because of my age. Seriously, I think, I think people are like, okay, good, now just start evolving down. Just bring it down now. Okay, you're a woman. Like now it's time. You're just gonna have to like just coffee, you know, like there's like, uh, what do you call it? My mom actually said this to me. What's it called when you when you have like one day a week that everybody plays for free? Like, uh, you know, like the po poetry night or, or, or... There's a name for it? Yeah, no, 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 no. There's totally a name. It's like, it's like um, at the coffee house. It's, yeah, it's, I didn't know there was a name. What? Mo open, open mic, open. Carla. Why don't you just, you know, there's a place right here. You, you could just do open mic every Monday. She's like, you could do it every Monday. It would be great. That's the natural progression for women, right? And they call that like maturing or aging gracefully. Exactly. And yeah. Lydia ain't going there, and no. I'm not going there. But where are we going? Because where's our audience going? They're getting older. They're getting families, they're having babies, they're, you know, I mean, it's, it's more and more dudes, honestly, to be frank. It's more and more guys now. Um, you know, older guys. I don't know what that means. I'm not, that, that's no judgment. Those guys deserve to hear some fucking ripping music. I'm, that is no judgment. I'm just saying it's an interesting progression, yeah. but I wish that I, I wish that I could talk to you about Lydia because I mean, she, 
she matters to me a lot and I I feel like what Lydia is trying to say is not being said like even by guys that are considered to be super hardcore writers like I, I just don't think they're even coming close to it she's so smart that she can't talk fast enough to stay up with her thoughts not just that she's already compiled but that she's realizing right at that moment you know and it's like it's it's like she's building you know it's like she's building a tower before your eyes so fast something that would have taken three years to build she's just building it so fast and and you know I love her I love her it's funny I mean I I think that she she uh, what was your question tell me I don't want to ignore you I'm not ignoring no, you no I know it's okay um just what your thoughts were on the visibility of women in rock history in general, whatever that looks like to you. Um, is there just like a gender discrepancy or was there and there's not any more your thoughts on that? Well, okay, my thoughts on that, first of all, I don't really care. Okay. Second, if I was to like take a stab at it, I would say that... Um, women were not far behind blacks in terms of how much they were discriminated against and that they are making much faster progress than blacks, I think. And, and um, that's in general. Um, but I can't say that I, I care that much because during my life there's always been tons of women in in music and they're doing exactly the same as everybody else just trying to get gigs and make their fucking music and make records you know and and you know do the best they can and a lot of them have to deal with having children which is not discrimination it's different it's certainly as damaging to their to the progress of their you know work but it but it isn't discrimination so um no but I guess like seeing people like Nina Simone or Billie Holiday you know I or Marianne Faithful, or whatever. I, I see people that are not in, it's almost like it's not, you can't call it the music business or music or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a different world. It's a, you go, yes, you pay your ticket, yes, you sit down or you stand up, yes, you listen, yes, there's a PA, but it just, isn't the same. You see a woman, you see a man, it's different. Mm -hmm. You go see this, I've never seen the Smashing Pumpkins, but I'm assuming they've had a male or female somebody, bass player or something. Let's just say, female, female bass player. but have they ever had a male? Do you know any bands that have had a male and then a, f a female something? No. Well, wait, a male and then a Who did you like say? Black flags. They have Kira. Oh, Black Flags. Oh, Kira. Yeah, yeah. Ding, yeah. ding. Okay. Kira, yeah. Kira, okay. Huh, interesting example because it yeah. ruins my whole theory. <laughs> okay, um, no, theory. but what I was... It. Yeah, really, it, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to the Kira thing because that was like, wasn't that like sort of around when Henry also yeah, came? So a that, that's a little confusing what happened there because I do, I do think that Henry joining the band overshadowed Kira um, by quite a lot, unfortunately. I hate to say it. Anyway, my point being, it's never the same. Like, if you just replaced me and made me a guy, it's, it's just a whole other story. I mean, it's just, it's just never, it's not ever going to be the same. So it's like, we can't answer the question. It's just, 
like like if Billy Holiday was a guy, it's just not ever going to be the same and I don't know. I guess that that's sort of how I feel about it is that is that women um I don't I I think that it has to be that sometime it'll be it'll be clear that see I'm bullshitting. I'm just totally bullshitting. Yeah. That's what's happening. I just don't I just don't care. I just think that it's okay. all gonna even itself out or not, and I and I think that it's it's um, very much. What's much more interesting is the fact that it's actually not the same thing. It's actually not the same show. It's just not go say go see Beyonce, go see Jay Z. It's not the same show. You know. And um, that's kind of how I feel, which is which means nothing except that it's it's just sort of vaguely interesting. But I I don't know I I I don't think that it matters all that much so so far. I mean I have high hopes for women and people of all genders, of course. Yeah. You know. Do you um, is it important to you that like? 50 years from now or something, your body of work is still accessible to people? Um, okay. Yeah, a lot. Okay. And that my mistake stuff that's all over my hard drives is somehow disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really matters to me. And, and um, also, you know, just on to bring back to a little bit the subject we were just talking, it kind of matters to me a lot that, it matters to me a lot that people begin to understand that when I am making music and I'm singing and I take, I start to write, that I am not a gender usually and I am not always a woman and that I'm often a man mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm not talking about um, character I'm not talking about a character I mean like because when I write I I'm just moving my hand so I I'm not oh, let's write about blah, blah, blah. I'm just like moving my hand. Then it, when it starts, then yes, okay, I will take some control if I can. But the thing is, when it started, it's already started. You know, like um, I have a song called Die Alone. And it's completely a guy singing. That's not nothing to do with me. It's not to do with me at all. Like, um, and it was supposed to be written for Towns Van Zandt, and it was kind of like me imagining him on his last night. And I don't even like his music or know him, but um, but it was it's 100% him singing. He's singing some stuff. I don't even know if it's true stuff, but um, there's a whole lot of songs. I'm gonna stop killing. Nothing to do with the woman. Zero. It's just a guy singing, and um, you know certain certain things. There's "Drowned of the Light" is a woman um, singing, very much having to do very heavy shit with uh, female issues. Mm -hmm. To me, this is the most meaningful song on the record. And then, um, and then the last song is actually me like me as a as yeah. as who I feel totally connected to like as I am now I'm speaking to you as me so the the thing that bothers me sometimes is that people write about the songs and you can see that it's different to be a man than a woman because they will refer to something about what that person is doing but a, the other gender would never do that. But it is the other gender. So it's like very clear that this actually is a separate issue. Like these are separate people, you know, on the stage. It's not when, when you go see a woman or you go see a man, it's, it's a different thing. 
there's very any logic to that. I mean, I, it makes sense to me. You can see what you're saying when you say it. Yeah. Yeah. So I when you have that 25-year-old boy and he sees a guy singing, swaggering around, singing about whatever sex thing, then he's going to be like, wow, old guy still got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anything that I mean I'm sure there's like tons of stuff that I haven't asked you and plenty of stuff <laughs> to talk about and I know that you we were going to talk a little bit about what you're working on currently I don't know if you still want to talk about that but when we were texting yesterday no no okay. I think it's okay okay I, um, I just didn't want to leave it out if... no because um, I think there's going to hopefully it'll come together in the next year it's not it's not something I'm I, need, I have these two records that I have to deal with first so that's going to take a while yeah. we're going to come see you tomorrow so ah. if we right okay good if we can get in else to do. coaxial <laughs> yeah. it's called yep I um that. and yeah that'll be nice I hope might be hot in there. I don't know. Probably. The way you described it, it reminds me of like an art gallery or something, and they're never air conditioned, so just be prepared to sweat. I've never been in there. Yeah. <laughs> First time for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I mean, is there anything else before? Um... I guess just um, you know don't stop going to gigs that's it well thank you very much oh and totally would love to revisit like 10 years from now and do follow-up because that's what that's what's great about oral history is that it's never over you just like add to it sounds so good we'll do it again 10 to 15 years good